Jerry, I think, uh, Bill, but, um, you know, growing up as a fan of all three teams, um, to me, his work with the Warriors was hard enough. Um, for, for a kid, you know, kids now are, you know, nowadays, NBA's on your TV every night. Back then, you were lucky to see one NBA game a week, you know, on a tape delay. So, for Phil, doing Warrior games for me growing up was just, I'd have my old transistor radio and stuff like that, and it was just, you felt like you were at Fortsight. I mean, this, I mean, so, you know, growing up, uh, Warrior fan, an Ace fan, Raider fan, I went and moving to, you know, coming to Fort, I grew up with Montour, totally different style, but with such a comfort, going to Bill came over to the A's, having been listening to him my whole, you know, life, essentially, with Warriors and Raiders, he just made that transition, you know, for me. And, and I still remember the day driving home from work and hearing Bill's passing. I mean, my heart just spoke that day because he was such just a huge, huge part of, of, yeah. my, of my life growing yeah. up. Yeah. And it was just devastating for me. It was still. It was a devastating day. Yeah. Wrong was. I think we also took Grant because it was always great. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. then it was. It's like, oh. for, me, for me, literally my entire life. Yeah. 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 Like, it was one of those things. Like,
content of the book and how it's going? Well, you know, um, I'm still getting asked to do signings. There's still interest from the bookstores. Um, honestly, it did really well on Amazon before Father's Day. Um, so the sales are still going on, and I'm still doing some interviews for it. Um, I'm sure it's, I, I, my sense is most people, especially A's fans, who wanted to read the book yeah. So I'm, I'm sure that the sales are going to wind down. I'm probably going to wind up doing two or three more signings as before the holidays again, like we did last year. Is it mostly Bay Area centric, or is it getting attention outside of the Bay Area? Most of the sales have been from here. Mm -hmm. um, we did a book signing at Uni in Phoenix, um, and I was blown away by that. The guy that runs the Barnes and Noble in Scottsdale is a big ace fan. <laughs> And he approached me to doing a signing. And I said, well, why would be, nobody's going to want to go to a signing in Scottsdale? But the A's cooperated, and Barnes & Noble kind of put on a signing before one of those. Right? <coughs> and we sold 104 books. Um, and it was A's fans primarily that come down from the Bay Area. Because it's amazing how many A's fans are traveling now. We go on the road to all these cities and you hear the fans. So there was a steady line for an hour and a half of people at that signing in Phoenix, New York, which I was told. So. Didn't you do one up in Seattle? No, I haven't done any in New Or was there Portland or something? No. I thought there was talk at one point. I did one at the Dublin Barnes and Noble over here. And then, uh, in New York, right? I saw on Twitter. I, there's a place called the uh, Regino or Regino Baseball Clubhouse. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Which is in New York, and they have a lot of baseball. Cool it's kind of a baseball gift shop. It's a small right. place, but the guy that owns it is a wonderful baseball fan. And he invited me to come down and actually do a talk there one night um, because he has a lot of authors that come there and, and, and they talk and they have signs. Well, we didn't have a night in New York, but I went down there and I just signed some books for him. There are just six books sitting there that I signed. Is all. So I, they're probably still sitting there. For <laughs> Anyway, yeah. Now that you can predict, and it seems like there's a lot of ace answer, and no one has the answer, but what is your perception of what's going to happen in the next five, six years with stadium talk and all the stuff? Do you have any? No one has an answer, but. I'm not going to give you a politically correct answer. I'm not going to give you like an A's answer. The honest to God truth, I have no idea. I don't have any idea. I just don't have any idea. I don't think they do. I don't, I don't have a clue what will happen. Seeley's still looking at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would put even money that five years from now it's still the same story. Yeah, the one thing about this committee, quote, there's been no transparency, which bothers me. I wish there was, they would report to us. It seems like the charade. Uh, let us know what's going on. Now, hopefully there are things going on behind the scenes, but I don't know what they are. And let's let us at least I think what the A's would like and what the fans would like would be to have an answer, yeah. one way or the other. Even if it's no. Even okay, if it's great. no. Yeah. So that there's a direction. And, you know, I mean, obviously the Giants are the impediment on the We all know that. I just wish that the, assuming that the committee has done its due diligence, then if there's been enough time, enough time has passed that so they could at least give us an answer, some kind of uh, resolution, so there could be, so we can kind of all move on. And the fans deserve that, the A's deserve it, everybody deserves that. So. Do you find that nationwide people say the same thing to you too? Like, do other teams or people you run across nationwide go, hey, it's really a shame what they're doing to you guys? Right, and I get asked all the time, what's what's going on with the stadium? And my answer is, I don't have any way to help There's really no, you know, I mean, I loved the Coliseum before the Raiders came back. Yep. Yes. I don't like it at all. That's the ice point. Exactly. Yeah, I, didn't, I don't like it now at all. Right. Yeah, right. You know, and I thought they, they compromised it as a baseball player. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love the funkiness of it, and I love the funkiness of the fan base. There's a, I don't know if you saw the Sports Illustrated story. There's a new story in it, and I saw it, it talks about the, the fans, and you know, the kind of the culture of the Ace fan, which I think is great, because there's a wonderful energy there. Yeah. Um, we need a new ball. Yeah. And, and I'm not saying that it, New ballpark is a panacea for every franchise. So some teams have got new parks and they're, they're still lousy, but I think the A's need it. Be nice to have. Yeah.
You know, now I would blow up Mount Davis if I could. Yeah. <laughs> but if the real smoke, can they deconstruct that? Yeah, they should do a Kickstarter for that. Like if you go down to LA to get it or something, well, that would we, be we, we were actually looking at it, it's like, if yeah. you just lopped off the top of it, like where the second row of suites is, mm -hmm. keep that, lose everything above it, and put two big high-res scoreboards up there. Oh. Like, it'd be great. You know, well, like, it'd be a great. Well, they're not using those. Exactly. I mean, especially since now the Raiders are tarping it. Yeah. But even then, I don't sit down in the bleachers, but there are places in the bleachers where you can't see the whole thing. Right. No, you can't. Yeah. And the bleachers used to be wonderful. Yeah. 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 And then you had the ice plant, you had the scoreboards, you had the manual operator out of town over here, and you had the view. And it was great. So. I remember they were building it, whatever season it was, they were building it throughout the season. It was my first year, it was 96. Yeah. 96. Yeah. And we would come back after after a road trip, and there would be another level built, and we'd say, "Wow, that's tall. Okay, that's that's got to be the end of it, right?" <laughs> and then they'd go on a road trip, and two weeks later we'd come back, and there was another level. Okay, that's got to be the top of it, right? And it just kept getting higher and higher. It was horrifying. <laughs> I think overall the worst thing with this whole stadium situation is not only that every time it sounds like there's about to be a resolution that gets pushed back, something changes. Even even now, this new lease is getting pushed back mm -hmm. a week. But the unfortunate thing is that in a lot of ways, it's pit ace fans against each other. Right. And instead of being united in one particular goal, you know, whatever that goal is, new stadium, whatever, we've got people arguing over Lou Wolf, we've got people arguing over San Jose versus Oakland, right. and who's a better fan than another, and unfortunately, that kind of I think it fractures the fan base in a bad way. It's a good point. I think it really is. It's a good point. I don't know what the answer is, to be honest with you. Yeah. Winning. Winning is always the answer. Right? <laughs> well, yeah, we're drawn pretty well now. Yeah, we yeah, are. been good. I mean, we're averaging about 23,000 eyes. Yeah. It's, it's the great truth of professional sports. Winning cures pretty yeah, much it does. But it's a mixed blessing because when you're used to coming in and there's 10 or 12,000 people in the stadium and you can move around on the concourse and yeah. get your food without missing the first <laughs> yeah. yeah. and you know, actually walk. It was so great. You know, we need the crowds, but it sure is nice on a Tuesday nice night. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I wonder if uh, anybody else who could write a similar book has uh, come to you and said they were inspired. I think especially if somebody like Rick Riz in Seattle. Uh, uh, Amy House. Right. Yeah, um, but has anybody come to you and said, boy, this is, this is put an idea in my head that maybe I can work with Not so much that, but um, I've tried to get the book to a lot of the other broadcasters, and I think they, they have that appreciation for Bill. Um, but no, you're right, maybe it will uh, for them. I know that Steve Stone wrote a book about Harry Carey you know, many years ago. But that would be a great call for Rick to do something like that about uh, Dave. You know, I have great respect for Dave, too. Yeah. Well, even even Dave Niehaus had that great call when McGuire hit that home run off Randy Johnson. Right. You, would, you would have thought he was an A's fan when he made that call. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that was genuine in his enthusiasm. It was just a matter of he loved the game, no matter whether it was a good play for his team or the other team. And you knew when the Mariners made a great play that he was going to get excited. So. And Bill really felt strongly about that. He really, because there was nothing in the middle with Bill. And, and I wrote this, that if he heard a call from another announcer of a home run that went against their team, and it was just kind of, you know, monotone. <laughs> and Bill would just get, he would, he would really get, literally get angry if he heard that. Because he just, it just ran countered everything that he believed in. He did justice to the other team. Being that Bill was kind of a centric guy, go on the road, did he ever have any weird, quirky superstitions or idiosyncrasies that maybe you kind of live, carry on to this day in any particular ballpark? Uh, eating Cheetos for breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, Bill and I were, uh, we had a lot in common, but we, had, we, were, we weren't we had a lot of differences too in terms of I think who we were, but um, no, I mean we'll toast to him a lot, you know, at the end of a dinner. We'll say Bill would have loved this and maybe we'll toast him, you know, a glass of wine. Yeah, a glass of wine. We'll go to some of his favorite restaurants. And Susan Slusser and I went out, we were in Boston one night to a place that you know Bill really liked. Um, so those three hour dinner. Those, excuse me? <laughs> three hour dinner. Three-hour dinner, but you know the thing about Bill is we had a negotiated time for dinner because he 
he thought eating before 10 o'clock was uncivilized. <laughs> <laughs> and I run, I, you know, Bill, and Bill was perfectly willing to go out by himself. You know, Bill, his self-characterization was that he was an inconsiderate son of a bitch. <laughs> and he, I mean, I think I wrote that in the book. Because he was the kind of guy that he would be perfectly happy if we would land in a city and he'd hang out and mess around for a while. He'd go out to dinner at 10 o'clock at night. And so a lot of the times when we went out, you know, I had to kind of initiate with him. But and I didn't hold that against him. That's just the way Bill was. But then when he did go out with people, he had a wonderful time. And he loved it. He was the life of the party. People couldn't wait to hear the stories. It was just fascinating to spend that time with him. But, uh, I mean, there are times when, you know, the, the story about, um, you know, give me an asshole who can play, you know, that's repeated a lot in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> a few <laughs> years. That's what, that's what I was referring to when yeah. he was blowing up about how yeah. the team was playing. So that was yeah. Yeah. Have you ever or, you know, that the Giants are playing. <laughs> yeah, you gave it. Yeah. Because he had this the acronym for the Giants was that they were the TFGs. <laughs> it doesn't stand for Frisco. <laughs> So how would he have called that uh, blown call today by the time? <laughs> no, I don't do a Bill King. I've never heard you do it. No, I don't. But <laughs> the, the thing, it. I want to make this, I, I do want to say this about Bill and the Giants, was that he, he really was a competitive guy, so he didn't like the Giants at all. He made that very clear, and I think everybody knew that. But the irony was that John Miller was one of his best friends, and so was Hank Greenwald. And he always gave them their due during the games, as I wrote or out of town scoreboard, he would always write their their game on the top, so he would give their score first because he he didn't really want to alienate any of their fans if they were yeah. listening. Yeah. And I would, I'm really indebted that John wrote the forward, um, and I thought he did an absolutely unbelievable job on the forward. You know, I was asked about about how Bill would feel about replay, and I think that he would have hated it all because he hated change. I mean, he was so unbelievably set in his ways. I mean, he was an incredibly rigid guy. He was a volatile guy. He was rigid. Uh, he hated authority. He was his own man. He lived life on his own terms. And so I think these delays during the games would have driven him crazy. Yeah. Someone imposing something on him was like the worst thing in the world. So that like imposing replay. But I think that maybe if two or three times he saw that maybe because of replay the calls were changed and they got the calls right, that maybe he would warm up to it. I got I get the sense that maybe he wouldn't have wanted to see it for all of the plays, but the, the boundary calls and the home run calls that he he might have accepted that. So the Cleveland call last year would have been He hated umpires, and I was prohibited <laughs> from speaking to an umpire for 10 years. <laughs> but don't you think that the, that the replay comes about as a result of a decline in the quality of umpiring? Is it worse? Maybe in that. Years and than it, than it was 10, 20 years ago? I don't think so, Margie. I, I really think that what's, what's happened is that high def TV has yeah. changed a lot. Yeah. That it was almost necessary that we went to replay because people can see the game better than the umpires can now from 18 different angles and beautiful high def screens and, well, and, I think and because of social media and all the things now you miss yeah. a call and the whole world yeah. can see it and it was I'm not sold on it myself um, but I think also once you hit the playoffs there's just too much money on the line you yeah, know, I mean, you're talking tens of yeah. millions of dollars for these franchises to make it to the next right. round, you know? And but they're still missing stuff. It's right. still, yeah. Yeah. They'll go to, because what's happened with replay, I think, is that now it has to be clear cut. Yeah. And, and there have been a lot of calls where Vince and I have been going, you know, I think that'll be overturned, and it's not because it isn't definitive. Yeah. So they're not, they're not making the call anymore. 
they're just determining whether it's definitive or not for them then to make the call. But they're not actually making the call if it's really tight. But like today, that was a play that I think should have been, uh, but it's not something to replay. Well, I think they made a comment, one of the players or somebody said that if they review it by pitch, why can't they review a foul tip? Exactly. Yeah. And why can't they review a ball that's hit in front of the umpire as a fair or foul? Why don't you check some stuff marks on it? Yeah. Yeah, they used to do that. Yeah. Uh, or they used, used to hold the ball. They used to do that with shoot ball. Shoot ball. Yep. Yeah. 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 But I don't think he felt tipped it in the first place. I don't think he did either. Did they look at the ball? Well, it was it was it I think Bart Holt held it up. Yeah. That was fine. What about, you, what about the, uh, you know, with the catchers, you can't run them over? What would Dylan thought about that? That rule. You would have hated that because he was a catcher. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's a terrible rule, I think. Yeah. I mean, it Thanks, Buster Posey. Over, because there was a play that was overturned yesterday for yeah. which games it's in the National League. Ridiculous. What do you want the catcher to do? Yeah. You know, yeah. He's been taught his whole life to catch the ball, and is he supposed to sit there and think, okay, I have to yeah. receive it here, and I'm going to stand here, and now I'm going to do this. Deal you know, just really well to it, though. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, don't, I don't like it. I think it's, that's something that has changed the game in a way that I was not yeah. I was not ready for. Do you think Bill misses the um, manager umpire ejection? Yeah, thing? yeah. Or, yeah. that was a great thing about today. Was that we had a real life, uh, you know, yeah. a real life argument. So yeah, yeah. He um, he loved what he did. You know, he really nobody loved broadcasting more than Bill King. He loved being on the air. And, uh, and as, as much as he had all these unbelievable interests. And as you know, the back cover is literally a painting of this, a photograph of a painting, and it's unbelievable. That um, he loved being on the air. Not, nobody enjoyed broadcasting like Bill. He loved the A's. Um, he really was an emotionally invested in the team, you know? and that was the way Bill was. You know, he didn't do anything half-assed. It was it was full on, full bore. So he. Uh, that's